Here's your primetime president and co-founder, Alan Tommy Cooper. Well, Great. praise God, Tommy and I welcome you to this program, which I believe people are going to find very, very interesting. Oh, it is. I, and, you probably would like to set your recorder. Uh, even if you will be around to watch it, you want to set your recorder. Uh, we have the privilege of having Jim and Penny Caldwell, Split Rock Research Foundation, Diamond Head, Mississippi. And uh, they have the most incredibly fantastic story. Uh, and I'm not going to steal any of your thunder, guys. But thank you for sending me your book. I can't wait to hear about it in person. And uh, you have been on an incredible journey for several years. She wouldn't even let me and talk to her while she was reading it. <laughs> <laughs> so where, where shall we start? Tell us about yourselves first. Okay. Well, we are oh so happy to be here. We thank you so much for having us. It is a real blessing to be able to come and sit down and talk with you. Um, we have come up all the way from deep south Mississippi here <laughs> to Texas, and um, but we're bringing a story to you from all the way on the Arabian Peninsula, yes. because there are some amazing things that are being uncovered there in our day and time, and we are only so blessed to have able to, been able to be a part of that. Um, Jim and I lived in uh, Saudi Arabia for 12 years. He took a job there in January of 19... Well, actually, in actually. September of 87. Mm -hmm. And um, he announced to us that he would be moving our two children, which were then three years old and five years old, and myself to Saudi Arabia. And I promptly asked him, with what wife were you planning to go? Because I'm not going to go. <laughs> she so. went, but she went kicking and screaming. Yeah. I mean, it was yeah. literally clawing the, uh, the asphalt until we got on the plane. And then she couldn't get the door open to get back out once we were taken off. Right. So we did right. manage So he to, did manage to get to, me over there. We did manage to get her there, yeah. But, um, at any rate, uh, we have so much to be able to share. I'm going to try to just tell you very quickly how we wound up looking for this wonderful mountain okay. on the other side of Saudi yes. Arabia. And that would be a mountain called Jebel Al Laws um, and Jebel Makla in Arabic. And um, we were uh, just. I, tr I wanted to say happily working in, over there in Saudi Arabia, but I wasn't really happy about being there <laughs> at the beginning, to be sure. But after the Gulf War, the children and I were actually sent out, as were most of the families, during the time of the Gulf War. We lived right on the Persian Gulf. Um, the Scud missiles were actually flying over our home to get to Dahran, Saudi Arabia, wow. and from you know the, the first Gulf War. So it was very dangerous for the women and children to be there. To make a long story short, I didn't return to Saudi Arabia until July of 1991. And uh, it was a, a whole new world after the Gulf War had taken place. And uh, it was very difficult for us in a lot of different ways to readjust to living there. But Jim was working a night shift out at, this is, at the time was the largest. Why was it hard to readjust? Well. Everything had changed a great deal after the Gulf War. 600,000 U.S. soldiers were on Saudi Arabian territory, and there was a great controversy about that because uh, Saudi Arabia is considered the holiest Islamic country of all because they contain the cities and the shrines at Mecca and Medina, which are the holiest of all to the Muslims. And the idea that that many Christians or other religions Pagans. <laughs> yeah, what they infidels. would consider to be infidels, infidels were on their soil. Mm -hmm. The whole dynamic of the region changed very dramatically in how they perceived us being there. So as we as we um, were trying to readjust, and I, we were almost apart for a year because of what had happened there, and for us to fly back into that and try to get readjusted to the life we had there, mm -hmm. which is a very different life living on a, an American compound, sure. um, it was very difficult. In fact, we were at each other's throats quite a bit, <laughs> and it, it's a miracle that we are still sitting here together with you, I would add. Yeah. But um, God had a plan that, we, that was so fantastic and so amazingly um, we could have never dreamed of something as big as what we wound up 
being dropped right down into the middle of. Uh -huh. Jim worked a night shift out at the refinery, which was the largest in the world at that time, right there on near the Straits of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf on the east side of Arabia. And he went into uh, work one evening, and I went to pick him up at 11 p.m. because he was working a 3 to 11 shift. And when I saw him walking out toward me, toward the vehicle, this is the early part of December of 1991, it was as though his hair was blown back. He was white as a ghost. And I thought, oh my gosh, something awful has happened. But when he got in the truck, he could barely even speak to me. And by the time we got back to our house, which was only a five minute drive, I mean, you know, you're right there on the compound. He began to tell me in very broken language just what he had seen. And he had had an, uh, just an enormous vision. And this was a man who wasn't so sure that visions existed. Uh -huh. I, I was very skeptical of visions, of people that had visions and then, then tried to, it may be a vision concerning your life or one thing or another about your, you know, what, what you're doing. And so visions were, you know, distant to me. I had never had a vision. Uh, I went into work at evening to make a long story. It's very well detailed in her book, by the way, this whole story. But I had a vision that the Ark of the Covenant was being carried through the desert back to the place that it was built, and that I was to go there, and that we were going to find the Ark in a cave. And then the vision, vision stopped. So when she met me, I, I, this is just poor. I'm pouring over this in my mind. To be honest with you, I didn't even know where the Ark of the Covenant was built. That was my lack of knowledge of the Old Testament. And I'm telling her this vision and the other things that went along with it. And I'm saying, we've got to go to Mount Sinai. We have, we've just got to go. And she's, yeah. she's just saying, what are you talking about? I, I don't understand. What are you talking about? I said, no, this is so real. It's giving me mm -hmm. chills down. Just, yeah. It was so real to me that we have to go there. And so for the next three weeks, this was in December the 4th, as a matter of fact, of 1991. For the next three weeks, we planned on going, driving our vehicle across Saudi Arabia, 24-hour drive, entering into uh, Jordan, crossing the ferry onto the Sinai Peninsula, and going to, the tr to Mount Sinai, which is where we thought it was, of mm -hmm. course. And, of course, in the Bible, it talks about the Ark of the Covenant and its construction. And of course, it is at the base of Mount Sinai. So this is what propelled us to go to make this driving trip across Arabia by ourselves. I broke all of the cardinal rules of traveling in the desert alone. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't care. I, I, I said, we are going. This is so powerful in me. The drive was so strong that we could not go. Mm -hmm. So this is what we did. You know, and initially, we did not have a clue that there was a controversy over the location of the real Mount Sinai. I mean, after all, um, you know, in fact, I'd known people who had gone and, and made a pilgrimage to the, the traditional site in the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt, uh, St. Catherine's, Jebel Musa. Um, and so we just plotted our course to go exactly straight there. Mm -hmm. um, but in that little interim time, that three-week period of time, um, I'll, I'll just have to explain this to you. Over there in Arabia, customs dictates everything. When you go in, even if you are a Christian or any other religion other than being a Muslim, they don't allow you to have any kind of uh, jewelry or uh, a Bible or anything like that. Now, there's plenty of them there because people smuggle them in all the time. But um, it's very, very difficult to maintain any kind of um, practice of what you believe unless you do it behind closed mm -hmm. doors. Mm -hmm. So um, everything's underground right. as far as the church goes. We managed to get hold of a, a VHS copy of the movie, The Ten Commandments, that somebody had smuggled in. Uh, you know, uh -huh. Charlton Heston, uh -huh. the whole thing. And so for three weeks, my children are now seven years old and nine years old. For three weeks, we solidly watched that movie day in and day out. Now, I know that it's not um, exactly mm -hmm. what the scripture mm -hmm. says, but you know, for a seven year old and a nine year old, we wanted them to have some kind of concept of why this is so important mm -hmm. and why are we blasting mm -hmm. off to drive to Egypt mm -hmm. to go to this place. And, and you know, we taught them about the Ark of the Covenant and everything. And, but Jim was devouring Exodus 
and so I was actually, I. I had actually tore the Exodus out of my Bible. I had an Amplified and then taped it up so I could fold it up and put it in my pocket uh -huh. and get into the refinery in the evening. Because if you were caught with something like that, you're out of the kingdom. That's it. So, mm -hmm. so uh, we would be, uh, you know, I would get into work, and I worked in the evening shift alone. And so when, as soon as I made my round, I would be sitting there, and then I would pour through and just reread and read and see what the geography of this place was going to be like. Get a mental impression of what we were to see when we would go. I really didn't know what the traditional site mm -hmm. looked like, mm -hmm. but what we should see through the eyes of the people that were there. And then, like she said, in conjunction with getting home and with the children, watching the, uh, this, this movie, the Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments, I mean, it, was, it built an image in our hearts mm -hmm. and minds that we were going to find mm -hmm. when we got to the traditional location. And lo and behold, um, as we started making this driving journey across Arabia, um, it was just us and our kids in the truck by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we took off from uh, Ras Tanura, I mean, right on... We lived a block from the water of the Gulf, of the Persian Gulf. Wow. We took off from there. It's about 27 or so hours up to a town called Hockel, which is the border of Jordan. You cross on over into Aqaba, Jordan. At that time, the Israeli borders were not open. We could only get into Egypt on the Sinai by taking what they called the Arab Bridge, or this huge big ferry, um, the kind that holds a thousand people and you can drive semi-trucks and cars mm. and trailers onto. So that's what we did. Um, but, and that's how we wound up on the Egyptian Sinai, headed for Mount Sinai. But what started happening to us as we went along was nothing short of, I, I don't know any other way to tell you, but supernatural events began to happen to us. Um, one of the most profound, and you'll see in a little while, we have some film and we have some photographs to show you and your viewing audience Good. that um, are very startling. And one of those things was uh, it actually began to snow on us in a place in Saudi Arabia. Now granted, it was January, but we were not up in the high mountains. And this We're event, that's right. It never snows in mid Arabia. Once well, every 70 75 years. years or so, yeah, that, that you might see a snowfall there. Mm -hmm. And it began to snow on us. And we videoed it. Jim was videoing it to prove to people this is not sleet or mm -hmm. hail, this is actually snow. Mm -hmm. What we didn't realize until he was zooming in with the camera is these little snowflakes that were falling were all, all looked exactly alike. Unusual. That's not really supposed to happen. No. I mean, we learn very young in science that all snowflakes mm -hmm. are different. But then it dawned on us, oh my gosh, what are we looking at? Because every single one of them, it was like, if you're a mom, you'll know what I'm talking about. You roll out cookie dough and you take a little heart-shaped cutter and you cut out a bunch of little hearts. Mm -hmm. Well, these just happened to be a bunch of little six-pointed stars of David. They were all identical. And you know, no, but you don't have to believe me, but I've got film to prove it. Uh -huh. And I hope we'll be able to, oh, to get into so that too. and show it, we show don't it have later. It with us, unfortunately. Oh, oh you it, don't? You have to go to our website. Okay, okay. One actually, one it, is. Of, it, it is. It is a live website. video okay. uh, yeah. you can check on you our hear website. You scream in the background yep. and, and see the video of it, not so, uh -huh. freeze frame on the snowflakes. But things like that began to happen to us as we were headed toward Egypt. And, and we were noting them as, wonder what in the world is going on here. But this continued throughout our whole trip. To make a very long story short, uh, in fact, I'll just tell you, the, the book, uh, I call the book The God of the Mountain, because um, there's been a lot of talk about this as a potential, this Jebel Laws being the real mountain. Mm -hmm. But the story that hasn't been told is the fact that it, it's not really, it is about archaeology to us, because that's your initial doorway mm -hmm. into understanding that something might have been historically wrong right. for a number of years. But it's really more to us personally about the leading of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who carried us into Egypt and out again 